A lot of our Aboriginal people were used as uh, riflemen and used uh, especially to work at night. And, uh, and a lot of them were snipers and um, they, they were the advanced troop to find out because they were quiet. And, and, and uh, that's what I was known about too when I was with any non-Indians in our group was uh, Harry's quiet and you never hear him walking around. <laughs> As 1944 moved towards winter, Canadians continued in their campaign to liberate the Netherlands. Cut off from supplies, sometimes they had to tactically pull back and relinquish ground to the Germans. It was heartbreaking. The liberation of the, the Dutch people was a pathetic, pathetic sort of, uh, of scenario. Uh, one has to remember that we failed to push farther towards Bergen op Zoom. Already they had whipped out their flags and they were waving the, the, the Allied flags and the British flags for the liberation. But our advance was held up. So all the villages which were preparing for the liberation were suddenly recaptured by the Germans. And then a lot of them a lot of them were killed. The Netherlands had fallen to the Germans in the spring of 1940, but defeat had not lessened the resistance of Dutch civilians. Strikes slowed down the production of Nazi war supplies, especially during the roundup and deportation of Dutch Jews. Sort of towards 1943, actually end of 1942, what we had was the worst part is when they took all the Jewish people away. That was just dreadful. You see your friends go, your neighbors, you know. 40,000 Dutch Jews were hidden in attics and basements, including Anne Frank and her family. But 100,000 were rounded up and sent to the death camps. In 1944, in retaliation for a railway strike, the Germans cut off food supplies. That winter, 15,000 civilians would starve to death. It was particularly hard on the families in hiding. In the first place, we had to see that the people that were hiding were fed, carried pistols at times, and also took people over from one place hiding place to another one. When I had to go to another city one time, it was kind of getting dangerous then. I was in the train and the Gestapo came in to check everybody. Now I had about 750 coupons all wrapped around here. So I thought, oh my goodness. So. I pretended that I wasn't feeling well. So the man came over and he said, the soldier, he said, um, aren't you feeling good, madam? I said, no. I said, could you please help me to the bathroom? <laughs> if I think about it now, you have to be quick thinking. Oh, yeah. He said, uh, I'll do this. So he, he escorted me to the bathroom because that stuff was slipping, you know. And I told him I was about seven months pregnant. What else could I say? By the fall of 1944, it was now the dreaded Gestapo who were on the run. The determination of the Canadian foot soldiers was rewarded, as one after the other, towns and villages greeted their liberators. It was as if an entire nation was trying to wake up from a nightmare. I think um, they didn't believe it. And if, they, if the Germans came back, you push the Germans out of a town and then they welcome us and the Germans come back, they're going to lose their head. But uh, they broke down. They, when they knew it was for real, they were, they were just great. They couldn't do enough for the Canadians. 
It was just incredible, the pent-up emotion and the relief the people had from being four years under the Gestapo and the German occupation. You know, there were tears in their eyes. It was just uh, fantastic. Platoon Commander Charlie Forbes remembers the time he first saw Dutch women wearing their traditional clothes. I told my boys, I think we're in a convent. So I want everyone to be very careful, to be very decent, and to have a gentlemanly uh, conduct here. I don't want tomorrow morning to hear anything about it. We're camping here tonight. So, as usual, my boys found the best place to sleep, and they brought me some straws, and uh, the nuns started to carry the straw around for my men and so forth. And uh, the next morning, uh, I had a good rest, and I got up and went around as I did early in the morning to track my boys. Lo and behold, all the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> All the lads were around with the boys. The only one who slept alone that night is the platoon commander. <laughs> the Canadian soldiers in Holland call themselves the Cinderella Army. They felt that they got all the dirty jobs and little of the glory of their sister armies, the British and the Americans. But in the Netherlands, they were welcomed as heroes as the Dutch took them into their hearts and their homes. I remember uh, very well uh, a story that, that a soldier came to our door and he um, asked my mother if he could take a bath. And my mother said, yes, but we have only uh, cold water. And, and he said, oh, but I don't care, I'm a Canadian. So he had his cold bath and he was very Canadian. It was as if Christmas had come a little early that year. The celebrations had that kind of spirit to them as the Allied forces paused before a final sweep across the Netherlands towards the Rhine. Well, that was um, sort of a that was sort of a blessed experience, um, a, a town uh, celebrating its liberation. Um, the way they did it, after the battle was over and the noise would subside, um, there'd be this moment of heavenly peace. And then up would go the sound of bells out of the town. This happened again and again and again. They would ring not just a few bells, but all the bells in the town, in all the towers, and European towns have lots of bells, and they would ring them wildly, up and down the scale. Uh, little bells, big ones, and so on, and in a most gorgeous, bubbling sound. And as I think I described it at the time, a sort of a cleansing sound, just a purging sound. It was lovely. Um, I'll never forget it. I remember that Christmas in Holland, and we had three battalions come to us and have Christmas dinner with us. And we had the table set up in what had been an auditorium. And um, we decorated them and so on, and, you know, done as much as you could with what we had. And uh, they'd each been given a bag of candy and an orange as part of the, the doings for Christmas Day special thing. And, of course, when they got out, there were all these little Dutch children, dozens and dozens and dozens. And every man gave his candies and his orange to a child. It was beautiful. Once snow covered the land, the Canadians were as much at home as the Dutch. What they couldn't know yet was what lay ahead in 1945. They could only hope. A propaganda film made for the home front offered some idea of the sentiments overseas as everyone began to think about getting home.
Christmas. It's a bit of a job to find the right words, to say how much we're thinking of you all back home. For some of us, this is the fifth Christmas we've been away from Canada. If we don't write home as often as we should, or say thanks as nicely as we might, it isn't because we're lazy or not interested after being separated all these years. It's because it's kind of hard to, to put a lot of things into words. Well, you know how it is. You'd think it would be pretty hard to stage a party on a Corvette in the North Atlantic. But that's where you'd be wrong. A lot of fun can be had in a small space. Uh, I remember that day particularly well. Both sides uh, recognized Christmas and celebrated it. Uh, we didn't engage in any activity of any kind that resembled war. There wasn't a sound, as a matter of fact, all along the Rhine. You could, you could hear, I felt, the snowflakes, because it was drifting snow from time to time, fall on your lapels. One of my young men, whose name was Fraser, walked out on his own and took a stroll along the Rhine uh, in full view of the other side. And he even said when he came back that he had waved to uh, German soldiers and, and um, made a cheering sign or something of that sort to them and got a response of the same sort from them. So it, was, it seemed to just sort of bridge the entire uh, war at that time. As 1944 drew to a close, Allied forces were ready to strike at the homeland of the Third Reich. Success seemed certain, but at what cost? 